The Axiom of Choice is the famous expansion pack to the Axioms of Set Theory. It has a fascinating history, but for this video I'm just gonna stick to what it is, why it's important, and just what's the deal with this famous axiom. We'll also go through my favorite illustrative example of an elementary proof that requires the Axiom of Choice. The Axiom of Choice is something that I find very intriguing because depending on the context that it's viewed in, it can either look extremely intuitive and mundane, or absurdly powerful and to some degree even hand wavy. First, let's look at it as a standard statement about sets. It states that any Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty. Now a finite Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty and that does not need the axiom of choice. The axiom of choice is required to say that any Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty, including an infinite product. But this still seems rather mundane, right? I mean, why wouldn't a Cartesian product of non-empty sets be non-empty. There's something in all of the sets. <laughs> all this means is that given this infinite collection of non-empty sets, we can draw an element from the Cartesian product, which is in effect just making an infinite number of selections from each of those sets. But there's nothing in the axioms of set theory, the standard axioms of set theory, that actually allows us to do this. The mark of the axiom of choice is that it allows us to affirm the existence of mathematical objects without explicitly constructing them. For example, if we take the axiom of choice, then there exists a well ordering on the set of real numbers. What's the ordering, you ask? <laughs> well, I can't tell you, and I can't describe it, and I can't construct it. Not explicitly, anyway. I mean, if I could construct it, I wouldn't really need an axiom to tell me that it exists. I mean, look, it's right there. Using the axiom of choice is a very distinctive feel. It almost feels like a statement about what the mathematician himself can do, not an axiom about the properties of any mathematical object. But maybe this will be a little more clear with an example. Let's prove that every surjective function has a right inverse. <laughs> Every surjective function has a right inverse. Proof. Let f from x to y be a surjective function. All right, we have the surjective function. Now, since f is a surjection, I know that if I take any element of the codomain y and take its preimage, that's a non-empty set. All right, so we have a bunch of non-empty sets. Now we're looking for a right inverse of the function f. I'm gonna call this function g. So let's just let g be a function from y to x. Now, here comes the part where we invoke the axiom of choice to reach into the stars and claim our prize. Now g exists only through the axiom of choice. I didn't give a deterministic definition of what G is doing. I just said that for any Y, G of Y lands in the preimage of Y under F. So is G a right inverse of F? Well, let's see. If we compose from the right and we plug in Y, we know that's F of G of Y. And what do we know about G of Y? We know that it lands in the preimage of Y under F. So if I plug that into F, I get back Y. And so indeed, F compose G is the identity function on Y, making G a right inverse of F. Now, see, at this stage here, we have to use the axiom of choice. Y was an arbitrary set, so it may be an infinite set, and so there are infinitely many preimages to consider. Since the function isn't necessarily injective, the preimages need not be singleton sets. Now, pay close attention to, to the vibe here. We're just saying, for each element in Y, pick an element of its preimage. It's almost as though I'm shifting the selection process to the reader. We're not giving a deterministic definition of what the right inverse is actually doing. We're just saying, oh, look at those preimages there. there. There's some stuff in there, map to something in there. <laughs> That's the axiom of choice. On the other hand, if I can describe the selection with an explicit construction as the writer, then I'm not invoking the axiom of choice. If the function were injective, then each preimage is a singleton set. So we could just say, pick that single element of the preimage. That doesn't need the axiom of choice. A function that is both injective and surjective, a bijection, has an inverse that can be deterministically constructed. So its existence does not depend on the axiom of choice. Likewise, what if X was a well-ordered set, like, like the set of natural numbers? Then each preimage is a subset of X, and so it has a least element. Now I can say, for each y, map to the least element of its preimage. 
This is deterministic. I've constructed the inverse. I didn't shift the selection to the reader, so I did not use the axiom of choice here. If x is well ordered, then any surjective function from it has a right inverse, and this does not depend on the axiom of choice. If x is an arbitrary set, then the existence of the right inverse does depend on the axiom of choice. You may recall hearing at some point that the axiom of choice is equivalent to the statement that every set can be well ordered. This example actually gives a nice view into that. In our proof, I used the axiom of choice to directly show the existence of the right inverse, but I could have also used the axiom of choice to put a well order on x and then construct the right inverse based on that by selecting the least element of each pre-image. Either way, I, I had to, you know, cast the spell at some point. The axiom of choice is a really unique field, and I promise you'll get an intuition for it in time. It, it grants us a special power as mathematicians to construct objects through our own indeterminate, unstated selection, giving us objects that exist through this axiom, but cannot be explicitly described because our selection has no explicit description. We just sort of reached into the cosmos and, and grabbed it.